Now, we're at Networking Field Day 30 this week, and we've been talking to a lot of companies that are showing us what they think the future of networking is going to look like. And one topic seems to come up. Network as a service. You're probably thinking to yourself, what the hell is network as a service? That's what we're going to talk about. What, are the, what is the value of what network as a service brings? What would I want to use it for? And more importantly, why would I not want to use it? Because I don't know if you remember this or not, but there was this thing called cloud, and it was really awesome, and everybody had all these really cool ideas about it, and then all of a sudden, people started getting the bills for it, and now they're rethinking why they wanted to go do this crazy thing. So I feel like that we're starting to see some of those parallels in the networking space. And before everybody goes hard charging and, and we're moving everything out of the hardware space, I want to get a handle on that. So who in the room can tell me succinctly what network as a service is? I'll give a crack at it. Go so uh, network as a service, it's not a new concept. We've talked about you know finding some way to deliver a network where you aren't worried about buying the equipment, rather you just subscribe to it. And very high level, that's the idea. You pay a monthly fee, maybe by user, you get all you need to deliver that network. Um, we've seen iterations of this like in MSPs, who've been able to deliver networks this way. Um, but the reason why I think it's coming up now and the reason why we're talking about it a lot is because the idea of a, of a cloud controller-based management has matured to the point where the OEMs can offer this or partners like the organization I work for can offer this as a service um, to customers. And so I think that, that really it's a, it's a change in consumption model. It doesn't change what networking is or, or what has to happen in networking. It's how you choose to buy it and how hands-on you are in the deployment and operation of that network. I think that last point is really key because if we, if we use the other terminology that we're accustomed to in, in more general cloud consumption, we talk about you know, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. And, and with each of those, it's differentiated by how much control do you still want to have over the configuration and the different components that make up that service. And I think as we look at different customers, they're going to apply the same thinking to the network. Some may want to completely outsource it to where essentially, as long as I have connectivity, I'm good with it. Others will still want to remain very much in control of it. And some will want to shift to network as a service purely for the financial aspects of shifting from CapEx to OpEx. The challenge I think is gonna be as we look at vendors and MSPs coming to market and, and actually building these solutions is, I don't think they're going to necessarily be able to offer that full gamut. You're gonna to have to essentially come to market and say, we're offering this flavor. And therefore it's gonna be interesting to see how customers respond to, I want this technology, but I didn't necessarily want it quite that restricted. And so I think that's gonna be an interesting point of decision making for, for most of our customers. I think it's funny that you, oh, go ahead. I, I wanna to continue to, to push on that because I see this as, as two main components. You have the component of the actual leasing of the gear, the subscribing to the gear, and then you have the management component, which you can manage it yourself or have the MSP manage the whole thing for you. What I'm trying to understand is where do you think more, is the value more of leasing the gear from a financial standpoint or having somebody else manage it for me? I think with public cloud, our customers want operational simplicity. And the other thing they want is OpEx expense rather than CapEx expense. So what I believe is network as a service will really give us both. So as far as some of the some of the companies that consume this, they're going to be after that CapEx or OpEx expense, while others, it's the operational simplicity of what they've gotten used to in public cloud. And we know not all workloads for security reasons and various reasons can't go to public cloud. So it's basically kind of bringing that to the users on premise. And just to hop on all of that real quick, and I think another thing too that's nice about it is in certain instances, not all, because it's obviously a situational thing, it's, it gives the opportunity to eliminate that hardware footprint, right? If you have everything as a cloud-based controller, then you can, like you said, keep that performance, keep overhead and cost low, and then you're still going to get the highest performance out of all of it. So one of the things I want to call out is you, you asked the question, like, which is the, which is the more advantageous thing about it? I, I don't think in this we can paint with one broad brushstroke. I'll, I'll pull, be the first one to pull out the consultant answer and say it depends, right? <laughs> um, Situational. Well, and, and so like I see, I see networking kind of heading in one of two directions. There's the companies who their network is the um, is a differentiator for their business, mm -hmm. and for them, I don't think network as a service is going to make a lot of sense. Um, maybe, uh, maybe the cost component, like you asked about, they might yeah. lease equipment because it makes sense for for operational expense. 
Um, but they're not going to want anyone with their hands on because they want to use it as a differentiator. But I think there's a lot of companies out there where networking is just plumbing. Like networking is just, it enables their business and so they need it. But right now they're having to staff a, a pretty significant talent pool to maintain and operate that network. And for them, they're going to be very interested in, in seeing that go away. That rather than pay for people, I pay for the service. It's not a great thing for us as networkers in those spaces, but you're going to have people running, you know, networks as network as a service. We'll have to switch over to running them from there. Sure. Haven't we been here before, though? Oh, this is a I, conversation that keeps happening. 25 years ago, it was, yeah. this was a service we offered as a small consultancy. Do you want us to manage your entire network for you? We'll, we'll turn up the ports and take care of everything you need. We're going to monitor it at a remote knock, and it's going to cost you X. And that works for some customers because they don't want to hire the headcount. But then there are other shops for whom they, they do want that, uh, that control, and they're willing to spend that money uh, and so on. I think the shift is the complexity. So I think what happened is when that happened before, that was straight about operations and it was, it was about, do I really want to get into this? I think that networks are becoming so complex at this point that if you want to run a network today, what it costs to invest in the people who can do it and to do it well and to have it be reliable and we're so much more dependent on it, it's a different, it's a different equation now than it was 20 years ago. I think you hit the nail on the head there. You know, we've been doing network as a service for a long time. Using retail as an example, you know, store in a box. I've been doing store in a box for many, many years. And you get a pair of switches in a stack. You get a pair of firewalls. You get your WAN optimization device. You have this massively complex stack for a small little retail location, whereas now you have a much more simplified network stack and cloud management. And it seems to me the big shift is the vendors going after this business directly as opposed to, you know, VARs offering their own solution offering. But what, what really interests me is where is that kind of line of delineation, right? Because any network as a service offering that I've seen, there is always the question, you know, what is within scope? Because many times the network takes the blame and you're going to have to field calls for something that ultimately is not the network. So I think that's going to be challenging for many of these vendors to figure out. Yeah. I think it's also important to understand that there's a concept of network as a service that comes from a vendor that is offering you a solution. And then there is a concept of network as a service that um, from an MSP or any any other well company that is offering their management so that it it will be tricky to understand when, where the responsibilities lie and what's the limit because if it's co-managed then you will have a RASI model that tells you who is responsible who is who is going to be then uh who's the other work they're responsible for it doesn't matter who is going to be responsible regardless of and then you would have to then discuss, okay, so do you want our version of network as a service or the vendor's version of network as a service? Because this happened with SD1. Initially, SD1 had the concept of the customer is going to do everything by themselves and yada yada. And then providers came, we are going to give you the manage SD1. So we are going to manage the thing that you were supposed to manage. And then you go through free ticketing systems to deploy something. Some people are okay with this, some companies are okay with this, some others will not be, because then What's the time I'm going to invest on deploying certain technologies, even if I have them not have to? So I think it's interesting that we're drawing a lot of these parallels to the cloud, like Pete brought up, because this shift happened already. Things got way too complex when it came to SANS and all kinds of VMware, everything. And I don't want to have to deal with the operational stuff that's going on. So how do we, how do we deal with that? And the answer was, pay somebody else to do it. And that's what we got with AWS, with Azure, with GCP, with insert chuckle here, Oracle Cloud. Um, but ultimately what happened was, as that shift happened, nobody cared anymore. It was no longer about the mechanics of doing the deployments. We got rid of a bunch of features we didn't need. Yeah, first hop redundancy protocols, I see you. But more importantly, we even did away with concepts like DMs, and now, we deal with microservices, we deal with containers, we deal at the app level. The app is the atomic unit of what we deploy in the cloud. Could a shift to a, an environment that, and let's be fair, if you're having trouble trying to figure out what network as a service looks like today, Meraki, where everything is compacted, it is managed at a certain level, but much of the complexity is kind of hidden behind an event horizon, what could the Moroccification, the network as a serviceification, cause us to look at when we no longer have to worry 
about where to bend the pipes to make the plumbing work right. We just install the plumbing and everything works because somebody else is taking care of it for us. I think it's going to shift the complexity then somewhere else because again, it's not going away. But it it all it is always then a matter of when you introduce too much abstraction. Then the fact that you don't see that a system is inherently complex, it doesn't mean that the system is not. And people tend to believe that, oh, it looks very cute in the GUI, probably it's simple. And then you have all these moving pieces behind or under it. And when it fails, it fails like any complex system does spectacularly. So I actually, and I'll get to you in just a second, I want to back up because you say it's going to move the complexity. I agree that it's going to move some of the complexity. I think that other pieces of the complexity will vanish because they don't need to be there anymore. And something, a, a, th a throwaway line, admittedly, but first hop redundancy protocols. We have spent years of our lives, years, trying to solve problems. Anyone who's ever configured OTV knows what this is. Why? Because some idiot out there said that the IP address on my machine can never change. So I have to create a protocol to tunnel over another protocol for another protocol to be able to move the machine from Los Angeles to New York and it doesn't change the IP address because, oh my God, things will break. And then a company not, like Netflix comes along and goes, you know what, I'm gonna write a script that breaks things on purpose to prevent me from boxing myself into that kind of a corner. So there's no box in Amazon to check that says enable HSRP because Amazon assumes that you do not hire idiot developers that write applications that can't survive changing an IP, changing the availability zone. Tom, they don't assume it necessarily, but I don't think they care because for them to func yeah. to operate that cloud at the scale that they do, they have to have rules and boundaries and architectural guidelines that you mm -hmm. must fit into. Yeah. If we take that concept and move that down to network as a service, it means we maybe give up some features and some nerd knobs, but the network becomes simpler to operate and, in theory, more reliable. I don't think that's a bad thing. I, I'm going to chat a couple of things here. So I don't think the network becomes simpler. I think that we abstract the complexity. And the only way you abstract complexity is by having the underlying complexity being repeatable and consistent. We've yes. learned this. You cannot build abstractions over the top of, of non-repeating systems and non-consistent systems. That's why you have constraints in places like, you know, the the the, the global cloud providers. They no, put those constraints so they can build those networks. But you also mentioned like abstraction kind of just moving complexity. We all have a model for this, and we have multiple models where this has happened. Like mm -hmm. people don't code, you know, in machine code anymore, right? We we code in higher level abstractions because we're able to to abstract around because we have that consistent underlay. So it's it's just as complex as it's ever been. The processors have not gotten any any less complex, right? But we write at a higher level because we focus on the things that matter that actually give us something to accomplish. And we don't have to worry about the underlying instruction sets. It may not be the most efficient. There's all kinds of arguments. There might be some like niche use cases where you have to go in at that level of detail. But for the large majority of people, you can code in Python rather than machine code and get the job done and do it well, right? And so I think that you know those abstractions translate. Uh, we're going to see that. There will be networks that don't do this because they're the, the machine code and have the niche requirements. There's no but, flakes. But right. But the <laughs> large majority of networks are not that. The large majority of networks, we don't, I, I would, I'm guessing, I, I, I'm, I'm going to postulate here that there's the large number of companies out there don't care about the mechanics of networking. What they care about is the policy. They care about what the outcome is. Yeah. But going back to your original comment, the companies that do care about the mechanics of how the networking op operates are the ones that are driving value for RUM, their network. They're the ones who, who the, the network is part of their revenue stream. Right, it's their differentiator. Yes. It's the service providers, it's the yeah. transport networks. It's the people who are offering high-speed munis municipal wireless. They care because every network change that they make has a real dollar amount. It goes but, beyond that. Think about companies like Steam or companies yeah. that do like gaming or media distribution, yeah. like where their network is part of their competitive advantage, where it's part of their revenue stream, uh, they're not going to give that over to someone else to do. They want no. that machine code level of yeah. controllability on their network. I, I think I'm arguing a subtly different point. Okay. When I say simpler, what I'm saying is we're going to take away some features because you got, you're going to, if you want network as a service from us, you're going to have to fit into this box. You can't which means like the 15 new BGP features that came out in the last month from the IETF, they're not going to be there and they're never going to be there because you have <laughs> network from a service from us and we don't support those features. That's the way it is. You get what you get. Agree with that. So I, I don't think it's an abstraction thing in that context. I think it's, you're just going to get less. You're going to get 
this service, whatever this is, and no more. Right? And and I and I I would be remiss if I don't go back and mention Justin Warren recording an amazing tech unplug presentation many years ago in Austin, Texas, about why people want cloud and why projects fail. And in his specific case, he said, "Do you want?" a car with three cylinders in the engine. No, nobody makes that. You can have four, you can have six, you can have eight, 10, 12, but you can't have three or five or 11. You could have it if you go learn how to build an engine, if you buy all the parts yourself, if you put it together, you can have the custom handcrafted artisanal car with an 11 cylinder engine, but nobody will offer you that. And I think that that's part of what we've gotten away from in our race to be the saviors for everyone is I can fix all of your problems in the network. I can create the, world, the world's weirdest snowflake that can anticipate all of these crazy problems when what I should have been building was an ice machine. Your ice, your ice cubes don't fit in my water bottle. That's not my problem. You bought my ice machine. Get a different water bottle. Going back to your Meraki example, Tom, I think that's, that's the exact example there. Meraki's great for certain customers, but as soon as you need to go outside the box that Meraki puts you in, you need a different solution because Meraki doesn't want to give you all the knobs and expose it all to you to be able to do the thing. And more importantly, they've drawn that line. Mm -hmm. If you need to take a full BGP table in a router and have, you know, hitless failover, we're not your company. You need a thing we can't provide. That's like going to, I don't know, that's like going to a Freightliner and asking them to build you a sports car. We don't build sports cars at Freightliner, we build trucks. So if you want a thing that's on the lot today, we'll give you the thing that's on the lot today. But don't come to us looking for a custom solution. You either have to do it yourself or go pick somebody else. And I think that that's a hard thing for people to do, especially when you look at the people who are offering that. Because you know, uh, here at Networking Field Day, we've heard talks from Juniper about doing networking as a service. We got this great presentation from Ken Duda talking about that they're setting up the architecture that will get them to that point. I mean, even a company like Ariaka is kind of offering their own flavor of networking as a service, but only in a very small scope in the SD-WAN, SASE, SSE space. And then we look at companies like Nile, who are kind of floating out there on the horizon, talking about what we're talking about here. Basically saying, we're, we're going to come in, there's going to be a box that's drop shipped to your location, two days later you have a network, we'll manage the whole thing for you, you don't have any worry, anything to worry about. But boy, if you want like Wi-Fi 6E support, we don't offer that right now because we don't have that on our, on our truck. So is that, a, is that enough of a value proposition for your average company? Let's, let's toss out the corner cases. No service provider is ever going to do network as a service. No, not for their own network. No Fortune <laughs> Five. <laughs> no Fortune Off Five. No else, Fortune Fifty. I just agree with do. that statement. Why? I I disagree because think about large retail, right? Things that sit in Fortune One Hundred just because of the sheer number uh, or what their revenue numbers are. Huge, huge retail shops where you just have this repeatable. Like every branch does the mm -hmm. exact same thing. I just need a stack there mm -hmm. that is consistent, and I don't want to touch it. Like I just like right now the way that they're building those stacks is they, they build them, they ship them out, and everyone is exactly the same because they have to manage them at scale. It could be a, it could be a hybrid though, Jordan. So, so you, go, you do network as a service for the, the retail store. Absolutely. Maybe, maybe the core is not. If that's well, of course. Yeah, I don't Correct. think it's an either or proposition. I don't think, yeah. That, yeah. I don't think that every, I mean, some, some shops might go in and say, we're going to replace everything. We're just going to pay someone else to do it. I think that there's going to be a hybrid model here when you talk about retail. Because retail, like their data centers and their core, like, they're not going to want to give that up because that's their competitive advantage. They know how to run that stuff. Mm -hmm. They know how to scale, although most of that's in the cloud right now. So let's let's spin <laughs> it to something that's not necessarily like that. Um, what if we run into a situation where you have a small, like, repeatable network that has certain um, uh, consistent assets, something like a hospital? Could you see network as a service in a medical environment? I guess it depends because... Then uh, do you have a problem with us managing your network? But then where do we draw the line of the responsibility with regards to security? Where do you put that? Because it's tricky. Who's going to do security? Are you going to do security? Or should I do it? Should I then network as a service is going to cover connectivity? And then are you going to have security as a service? Why is the security on a hospital network any different than the one on a retail network? 
I guess you, nobody dies here. You, you got, you've got <laughs> clients issues. You've got yeah. uh, yeah, it's, sensitive it's personal data. information. I can, uh, yeah, I can machines just, that can't go offline. Yep. You know, hospital environments are serious business, and literally life and death. Yeah. And I and I'm only speaking briefly from like the time I was in healthcare, but just like there's so many things like the, if the EDR like having dedicated servers with an EDR or yeah EDR no EDR, boy I forgot it, but EHR? it's yeah EMR. EHR thank yeah. you EMR EMR solutions you know that can't go down and that's happened before too. HIPAA compliant. You, uh, you also have to support such a wide variety of endpoints. That's my bigger concern is, yeah. you know, again, where is that line of delineation? If a switch goes down, that's easy. The network as a service vendor must take care of it. But if, you know, in a hospital example, you have so many different devices. You have time clocks. You have Vocera devices that are people are using for voice. You have medical devices. So how is this network as a service provider going to have any insight into some of these one endpoints that might behave a little bit more erratically. So can you do network as a service in a hospital? Maybe, but that certainly would be not my first choice. So you guys are tap dancing around the problem here. If the issue is endpoints, does that mean that network as a service fails when it hits IoT? I, I don't agree with the endpoint thing. I think it comes down to uh, priorities and I think responsibility has been brought up. The idea is that when, mm -hmm. when you have a risk associated with it, like, you know, <laughs> when the people who come to enforce that compliance come knocking on that hospital's door, you're not going to be able to say, well, it was them. Right. You're not going to be able to point at your at your network exactly. service vendor. You yes. are ultimately responsible. And when that is in your hands, that may not be it. But that's a compliance question. Like, I, I don't I don't think it's an endpoint question. So how's that different than what we have today where VAR comes in and does all the deployment and then something breaks later on and the hospital staff is like, well, we didn't configure it. Does the, does the VAR assume the liability for what happens? And, and let's hope that we don't get to the final liability. And that's, you know. But, I mean, we all know that that's why Radio Perlman created Trill, was because a hospital crashed because of Spanning Tree, and they couldn't get it to come back online. And, and obviously, that was, you know, it's kind of an, an anecdotal story. But what happens when your hospital goes down because of a security incident or because of a, a misconfiguration? Is there really any difference between it being a network as a service vendor or your own IT staff? But you're still going to have a throat to choke somewhere. Yeah. I think from a security and compliance perspective, if, if, if we go back and apply once again, like the, the cloud terminology, mm -hmm. in, in all of them, in the shared responsibility model, no matter whether it's IaaS through SaaS, security controls and compliance is always the responsibility of the customer. Even if yes. the provider is mm -hmm. giving you a service that provides you the capability to make those configuration and policy changes, ultimately that is always the responsibility of, of the customer. That's real easy for me to negotiate whenever I'm talking with a VAR who I am, there's a scope and a statement of work for what I'm going to deploy here, but I am effectively handing my entire IT department to somebody else to manage. And whether you call them an MSP, whether you call them a network as a service vendor, is there even the wiggle room inside of there for me to negotiate a thing where it says, as your provider, I will make sure that your network never goes down, quotey fingers, but anything that happens from a security perspective, from you know any of these other things that are not covered, just like any standard insurance policy, not my thing to worry about. Do you think they would ever sign a contract like that? Uh, well, this happens now, maybe not under those specific words, but it happens now when you have a managed service provider telling you, I'm gonna take care of your network, fine. I'm gonna take care of the connectivity part only. And then there will be another supply taking care of your security part. Which means that when there is an incident, you will have a call with 300 people, 298 managers, and two engineers trying to find out the problem. Because you have a one-stop shop solution that offers the security, covering the network devices, all that. Where if you did, then that's one thing. But I don't think people are going to want to deal with multiple vendors. In public for... cloud, security is a shared responsibility yeah. with the customer and the cloud provider. I think it would be the exact same with network as a service. It's just where do you draw the line? Yeah, and I would argue that you've got to run, you're running into a situation, let's just pick the two biggest networking vendors out there, Cisco and Juniper, who also just happen to have security departments. Do you think that their security teams are going to want to leave revenue on the table? No. Yeah. If we can get an uplift per user for an extra X amount of dollars per month to add security onto that, don't you think they're going to want that? Because you know who else is going to want that? Cisco and Juniper shareholders. Oh, yeah. Because a lot of what we're talking about right here is driven by the fact that what Wall Street wants from these companies is consistent revenue. revenue. Yep. Mm -hmm. I want you to get money coming in every month that can't be t that tap can't be turned off because as we've seen with companies like Meraki and other companies that offer this monthly service, once you don't pay, 
You're fried. Everything shuts off. And that makes your equipment really sticky. And if it's really sticky, <laughs> I don't have to worry about this messy integration bowl anymore. Because if you want to increase your network spend, you're already paying me for it. You might as well buy more from me. Yeah, you're not going to leave food on the table. That was, that was one of the questions we had in the sessions with Jennifer, for instance, then. Okay, so what happens you know, when we had this analogy about being the network as a service, your phone bill? Okay, so what happens if I don't pay my phone bill? Then are you going to cut the phone off? It's going to turn into a brick? Because also it would depend on which ones are the conditions under your subscription is going to be then what reactivated after we disable it. Is your box going to turn into a brick or is it going to have work or is everything going to turn into a read-only mode and you would not be able to do changes, then what are the limitations? There's Nothing to contract to. There's a lot of service-specific questions that obviously, depending on the service you're looking at consuming, need to be answered. Uh, I think if we, if we set the te technical side of this aside for one moment, you look at why businesses are adopting as a service or adopting cloud, it's not just for technical reasons, right? It's everything from uh, you know, shifting liabilities, shifting operational burden, taking on new capabilities. But total cost of ownership too. Total cost of ownership. I think one of the other things that, that has just commonly been associated with uh, as a service is this expectation that things can be done with greater agility and faster. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to be really interesting to see if they come in from a business perspective and try and apply that to networking as a service. What does that really mean? Right? I mean, obviously, if you want to be able to have a configuration change made, then that with the kind of cloud controllers that Jordan's talked about can be done very quickly. But if they're expecting, I can you know, take network as a service now and get a circuit dropped into a new branch site much faster, that's not happening when we talk about network as a service. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of discussion here around what would be the driver to adopt it. And you know, Rita brought up a point earlier on in terms of there may be a hybrid, right? Some, some mm -hmm. would be network as a service, some would not, that's depending on the use case. And yet every single one of us, as we talk to customers around how do I operationalize a hybrid environment or a multi-cloud environment, it's now a whole different type of complexity. It's not yes. the complexity of the technology, it's the operational challenges of having a disparate environment. That's going to potentially apply. I'll and I'll say, here, but I actually want to talk about that in just a second. Yeah, so I, I think all of this conversation, I think someone who, um, who lived through the the you know compute and application side of cloud? They'd be laughing at us right now, right? Because they've <laughs> they've done all of this. Like every concern that's been raised around this table has been raised around compute. Mm -hmm. And if you want to talk about you know security and compliance and like things like patient health information or whatever, but EHRs are offered as SaaS offerings. Yeah. All kinds of high compliance environments are offered as uh, you know, cloud environments, and the, the, you know we have which is probably a bulk of the market share. Right. Yeah. Posted. Right. And so, so I think that I'm not saying that these things aren't challenged. They're absolutely going to be challenges. But it's not like there's not uh, an analog or some sort of example of the way that this is going to go. I think we just look at that transition to cloud, both the both the good things and the pitfalls, and we're going to find very very similar things That's as good. we talk about it from a networking perspective. Yeah, it's going to be with transition and e transition. <laughs> laying it out. I do want to. Go back to, to what you were saying on the financial side of things, where I see potential benefit for IT teams is around budgeting. I've been part of budgeting conversations and budgeting for my CapEx, trying to figure out how I need to work that cycle because I have this gear that goes into service this year, this one that's right behind it. If you can shift that to a an as-a-service model where I know I just need to budget X amount per year, and hopefully I can work into my contract that hardware upgrades are part of that as well, I can see that helpful from a, from a budgeting standpoint. So I'll throw one more point on here kind of to close out. What would drive a business to adopt this? I don't know. I want you to go buy a missed access point and try to use it in your system without buying a Marvis license, without buying a subscription fee. Yeah. What's gonna drive me to adopt it is when the only thing on the truck is network as a service. Bingo. Maybe mm -hmm. I offer it to the people who really need it, but it's not the catalog anymore. You want to buy from me, you pay by the month. You pay, you don't pay right to use license. You pay a monthly subscription fee. And maybe we've grandfathered you in like on a cell phone bill, mm -hmm. but eventually you're going to get to a point where you need a new phone, you yeah. want a new plan, you want a new service. I'm sorry, we don't offer that with what you had. You've got to go to what we offer now. And I think that ultimately, 
that's the value prop that the businesses are looking at. Increasing rents, monthly revenue. But I'll leave you with this thought. It's an apartment complex. Nobody makes money operating an apartment complex. You make money when you sell one. So be careful of that trap and make sure you know what you're getting yourself into. Otherwise, just like a boat or a jet ski, you're going to find yourself the second happiest day of your life is getting rid of the thing. <laughs>